Did you hear that? If you're in your 30s or younger, you know exactly what that sound means. That is the most recognizable drumbeat of a generation, other than maybe... That's because it's the opening of a TV show that defined our childhoods. Arthur. The funny thing about Arthur is that it's so familiar, so in our heads, that the littlest snippet of sound or even a still frame from the show can trigger our nostalgia. For me, it brings back memories of being 10 or 12, or let's be realistic, I stopped watching Arthur when I discovered YouTube at age 16, and rushing home from school to turn our TV to the local PBS affiliate in time for the PBS Kids Go block at 4 p.m. I'd usually stay tuned for Maya and Miguel and Word Girl and the Holy Grail Fetch with Ruff Ruffman, source of my first gay crushes, but Arthur came on first, and it brings back memories of me and my brother sitting at our low kid craft table over a bowl of microwaved popcorn, watching our TV together as the sun set. And apparently people around my age have similar memories because Nathan Zed can play this sound and you know he's going into a fantasy or dream sequence, or you can just look at this picture and know that Arthur is about to hit his little sister, DW, in a moment of rage. That's how ubiquitous Arthur is in our entire generation's consciousness. If you're anything like me, Arthur connects you to some deeply private memories from your childhood. Arthur's distribution team has taken advantage of this nostalgia recently on TikTok of all places. Slade, no comment. Partially Slade. Slade the house boots down Houston on the seas. If you leave a comment, there's a good chance Arthur will leave some culturally relevant reply. I guess we can call this the phenomenology of Arthur. Phenomena. <laughs> No, not monomenology, that's Muppet Studies. Phenomenology means the study of what it's like to experience a work of art, what it makes you feel. Obviously that's very subjective, but it's worth studying because making you feel something is what art's all about. But there's more than just nostalgia that draws me to Arthur. If you go back and watch the show, especially the early episodes from when us old folks were growing up, you see it holds up. The writing is better than most sitcoms. There's jokes for kids and for parents watching along. Teachers don't live at school, DW. We have houses just like you. The world seems so simple before this moment. Plus there's some pretty savage parodies of contemporary culture. Arthur has parodied South Park, Beavis and Butthead, Teletubbies several times. And, of course, there's the social satire of Mr. Crosswire, the nouveau-rich, slimy used car salesman. Let's listen in. So what if the engine falls out? Once they're off the lot, it's their problem. And up until a few months ago, kids today could still watch new episodes of Arthur. Until February, when the show ran its series finale on PBS Kids. I know, let's cry it out. I've got tissues, I've got tea, beer if you need it. The final scene features some of the characters 20 years later. So as 28 year olds, I'm 27, so I'm not gonna think about that. As Arthur ends its run, I wanted to make a video essay about it because it's a show that's affected so many of us so deeply. But Arthur is also a PBS show, so it's supposed to be educational. I don't just want to study the phenomenology of Arthur, I want to study its message. What exactly was Arthur teaching us? Arthur bills itself as a show about social-emotional learning and problem-solving. And I think on a very obvious level, that makes sense. Arthur is a show about empathy. Even though the characters are animals, you see people on the show with all different skin tones, that celebrate all different holidays, or have traits that you or others around you may share. Buster has asthma, George has dyslexia, Mr. Ratburn is gay unless you live in Alabama, and it covers things that happen to kids in real life, too. Like having a divorced parent who started dating, or someone you know getting cancer. Those are the kinds of obvious things you notice, but the empathy lessons on Arthur are a lot more complicated than that. 
characters are constantly revealing themselves to be more complex than they originally let on. Like Buster, who needs to write a book report in that one episode, but has never read a book all the way through. So his friends keep recommending him easier and easier books, which he still can't finish, until he reads Robin Hood, and it turns out that he wasn't dumb or lazy or anything like that. He was just bored. Buster is an especially wonderful character. He's obsessed with aliens, he takes foods that he loves and saves them in this little terrarium in his room. He just marches to the beat of his own drummer. Shout out to actor Daniel Broku for creating such a perfect voice for Buster. Or Binky, the supposed dumb bully, plays clarinet and listens to classical music and dances ballet. Or Mr. Ratburn, who's rumored to be this sadistic teacher who tortures his students, and he turns out to be this goofball jack-of-all-trades who performs puppet shows for preschoolers at the library and eats everyone's cake. And DW. Don't get me started on DW. D.W. is one of the most powerful characters in the Arthur universe. For example, in one episode, Arthur and his friends are planning to go to the science museum together, and D.W. hears about this and wants to come along, but they're like, no, big kids only. So she creates an entire misinformation campaign that teaches pseudoscience to her fellow four-year-olds. And then Arthur feels forced to take her to the museum with him, if only so that she'll learn the real science and stop misleading four-year-olds. Diabolical. Okay, so Arthur is about empathy and about learning that people are more complex than you give them credit for. But I think there's an even deeper layer that Arthur taught us. So here's what I'm thinking. Arthur is one of the only kids shows that my parents watched with my brother and me that they actually liked. Sorry, Clifford the Big Red Dog, you do not share this honor. Even my grandmother loved Arthur, and when I asked her why, she said something really interesting. The kids on that show are real kids. They don't act sickeningly sweet. And it's true. The kids on Arthur are sassy. DW, please move your big, enormous, large, gopher-looking head. <gasps> sometimes even rude and smart-alecky. Why don't you go back to your own house and stop bothering us? And they don't always get along. Muffy is sometimes the house guest who thoroughly insults Francine and her family for being too poor to have cable. And... Francine sometimes gets fed up with Muffy and tells her to get the hell out of her house. Conflict resolution is a big part of the show. But it's not just sass and rudeness. Sometimes the kids on Arthur cause real harm. They do bad things. Kid bad things, but still bad things. Muffy cheats on a quiz and blames Francine for it. Arthur has two strikes against him. He bullies Sue Ellen so badly at one point that she almost switches classes, and he, in a fit of rage that is caused by something thoroughly annoying that DW did, he hits his sister so hard that it knocks her over. The interesting thing to me is the way the characters on Arthur, the friends, the teachers, the parents, deal with resolving harm. The kids in the show are thoughtful, they realize when they've done something wrong, and they often feel guilt about it. They dream or daydream about the consequences they might face. And because they're kids, they often imagine the worst. Jail, or torture, or humiliation. The dream sequences on Arthur are done with a wink and a nudge, but there's some legit psychological horror in there, especially if you're a kid watching. But the community on Arthur usually finds a way to do justice that isn't vindictive, that doesn't involve revenge or punishment for its own sake. That's right, I'm going to argue that Arthur teaches its viewers about restorative justice. I'll tell you a little bit more about the concept of restorative justice in a bit, but first, let's watch two episodes of Arthur together. Episodes where characters cause harm, and where there's a contrast between the punishment they imagine getting and the resolution that actually occurs. Grab your bike. We'll meet at the Sugar Bowl after we watch. The library's great. It's got this episode is from the very first season in 1997. 
Back then, the characters were still being developed, but Arthur did have one personality trait, which is that he loved books, hence his last name being Reed. This episode starts with an intro about how much Arthur loves libraries, obviously, how many things you can do there, how many kinds of books they have, but then there's this ominous little teaser at the end. <laughs> I love it here, but last week I thought they never let me come into the library again. So why would Arthur, the library's biggest fan, worry about being banned for life? Well, now we arrive at the title card. It seems like in these early episodes there's a lot of experimentation with narrative framing devices. The first thing we see after that title card is this creepy looking arm thing. Chapter 1. Arthur goes to the library. That's already a clue that we're going to be dealing with something horror-related. The creepy narrator actually has a lot of fun layers of meaning to it, as we're about to find out. The story begins with Arthur going hogwild in the library, checking out as many books as he can get his hands on, much to his friend's bemusement. But the librarian, whose name of course is Paige Turner, encourages his reading habit. You're one under the limit. You mean I can take one more? The new Scare Your Pants Off is in. So Arthur decides that for his final book, he'll check out the brand new release in the Scare Your Pants Off series, The Mysterious Hand. I think Scare Your Pants Off is their take on those Goosebumps books everyone read in elementary school except me because I was too much of a weenie. Anyway, this turns his friend's bemusement into resentment because he already has a stack full of books. Why does he have to hog the brand new Scare Your Pants Off? But Arthur wants to read it first, and, you know, the early bird gets the whatever, so he takes off on his bike, and there's nothing they can do. Of course, Arthur is a child who cannot control a stack of books on his bike, so the mysterious hand gets knocked off by a tree branch. And now you understand why the opening spooky hand is such a good framing device. The episode is set up like a horror novel, with chapters narrated by a mysterious hand, plus Arthur has done something genuinely horrifying. He's betrayed the trust of his favorite institution and lost track of a library book. And there's even a third layer of meaning here. After the book falls to the ground, a mysterious hand picks it up. If you're perceptive, you can see who the hand belongs to, but blink and you miss it. So a real-life mysterious hand rescues the mysterious hand book. The writing on Arthur is just chef's kiss. And now we get to chapter two. Chapter two. One week later. We find out that Arthur's scatterbrained eight-year-old sense of organization doesn't serve his love of libraries very well. We see books pop up in Arthur's laundry basket, in the treehouse, on every surface of his bedroom. And of course, he hasn't even thought to read The Mysterious Hand, even though all his friends wanted it, because he has so many other books to keep track of. It's only when Buster reminds him that Arthur figures out the book is missing. I forgot I had that one. Well, nobody else did. There's a waiting list to take it out after you return it. He freaks out, and because he thinks of himself as someone who cares deeply about library books, his first thought is that one of his friends stole it. Since he thinks somebody stole it, he figures he needs help finding out who did it. But all of his friends are suspects, so he enlists the help of the only person he knows who would never be interested in books. Binky, the big guy who everyone thinks of as a dumb bully archetype. You're the only one who can help me, Binky. You don't even read the words in comic strips. If they were any good, they'd be on TV. Chapter 3. The Investigation. Their detective work is unsuccessful. Arthur tries spying on people and trapping them into a confession. It's my book! I had to buy it because you have the library's only copy! While Binky's strategy is to just intimidate whoever's smaller than him without even telling them what he's looking for. If they took it, they'll know. So at this point, Arthur's hogged a book and accused his friends of stealing it. So everyone is understandably annoyed at him. 
including his bestie, Buster. You probably lost it. Although, leave it to sweet Buster to find some way of letting Arthur off the hook. Giant mutant mole people took it. Oh, right. I don't have it. You got it? Nope. I love this show. But at this point, Arthur has run out of excuses. Chapter 4. It's lost, okay? Face it, you lost it. And Chapter 4, It's Lost, Okay, Face It, You Lost It, this is the heart of the horror in this story. Arthur has a nightmare about what he's done and what happens when he'll get caught. It's a dream, so dream logic, but notice he imagines getting busted by the cops? His guilt, and what he knows about institutions, has made him imagine a carceral solution. The crazy cop arm thing drops Arthur at the library, and Ms. Turner... We have special rules for little boys who lose library books. That line is genuinely creepy to me. Poor Ms. Turner. She's truly a chill character in Arthur's real life, but in dream sequences, she keeps being made out to be this demon enforcer. The same thing happens in the episode where D.W. breaks the cover off a library book. You can never have another library card again! But I worked so hard for that card! Anyway, Arthur's dreamed punishment involves being literally chained to the library. Next time, don't make me use the crank! See what I mean about horror? But Arthur wakes up, and the next morning, Arthur's dad suggests that Arthur's punishment won't necessarily be as vindictive, but it could be harsh. You'll have to pay for the book, Arthur. Fifteen dollars? That's three action figures! Aww. So Arthur heads to the library, defeated but accepting responsibility. But he gets lucky. I guess I have to pay for it. It's not lost. Here it is. That boy just returned it. So Binky did solve the mystery after all. Of course, the person who ended up with the book was the last person you'd expect. A boy from school? Which boy? Me. <laughs> Very funny. No, who really had it? Me. I found it on the sidewalk. I started reading it. It's really good. I never thought it was the one you lost because you'd never throw a library book on the ground. I love this when twist no because Arthur and Binky both learn something about each other and about themselves. They both learn that people like Arthur, who love library books, can still be careless and that bullies like Binky can still like to read. Don't blab it around that I'm reading books. And then we find out that the mysterious hand narrator was, in fact, DW the whole time, because of course it was, and the episode's over. Hi, you like my Arthur cosplay? Oh shoot, I forgot the glasses. I'm making a video essay about Arthur, right? So I need to turn my kitchen into the sugar bowl. Okay, so the sugar bowl has partially tiled walls, it's got posters, including one that just says milkshake, and it's got this beautiful bright red neon sign that says cool. I'm keeping these teapot tiles made by my aunt Cassie to harken back to the tiled walls. I couldn't find a poster that just said milkshake, but I'm pretty sure the sugar bowl has the best milkshake in town. As for the neon sign that says cool, I don't really have the budget to get a custom one made, but this one is cool updated for the internet age. Let me know how I did. So the resolution to the library book episode is a restorative justice solution. For reference, I'm using the seminal text about restorative justice. It's called Changing Lenses by Howard Zare. Zare, by the way, is a cousin of one of the people who watches this channel, aka my friend. Hi, Adrian. Zare talks a lot about the problems in the justice system we're used to seeing in the US, what he calls retributive justice. One, it's based on the belief that you can separate out the good people from the bad people and lock the bad people away with long prison sentences. It responds to the harm someone has done by administering more harm. He also points out that criminal charges are completely controlled by the state, in this case, the prosecutor's office, 
And the needs of the victims, the people who've actually been hurt, are often secondary or not heard at all. The victim often gets little to no information about what's happened to the offender who harmed them. They get no opportunities to have their questions answered. The offender doesn't get the chance to try and repair the harm they've caused, either. Because our legal system is adversarial, a prosecutor versus a defense attorney presenting opposing cases, the offender is usually advised not to admit guilt, not to accept responsibility for what they did until the court forces them to. This is a bad outcome for everyone. The victim doesn't get a chance to have their questions answered, doesn't get to weigh in on what justice would look like to them. The offender doesn't take responsibility, isn't encouraged to repair the harm they've caused, and the court sends the offender to prison, a place that inflicts violence and trauma, and isn't a reliable way to reform someone. Zare's book, obviously, is about the criminal justice system, which doesn't directly apply to the kids on Arthur. But Arthur's fears, his dream about being chained to his library books, and even his wide-awake worry that he'll be banned from the library, suggest that he's aware of retributive justice in his world, Maybe he's seen it on TV or on the news, and maybe it's even happened to someone he knows of. Obviously, a retributive justice solution here, like banning Arthur from the library, would be a terrible choice. The library's purpose is to encourage people to read, and Arthur is its biggest fan. So what's the restorative justice alternative that this episode shows us? According to Zare, Restorative justice is a point of view that attempts to address the problems with retributive justice. Its focus isn't inflicting harm on an offender in order to achieve some sort of eye-for-an-eye -eye balance. Restorative justice finds balance by figuring out exactly what harm the offender did and attempting to fix it. Since the focus isn't on punishment, it encourages the offender to take responsibility for what they did, if in fact they did it, and to play a part in fixing things. It includes the victim to whatever extent the victim wants. The victim is allowed to suggest a solution that would be satisfactory for them, and most importantly, to ask questions about what happened to them and why. And that's what happens here. Arthur initially wants to deny that he's lost the library book, but his friends encourage him to take responsibility for what he did. The library, which I guess is the victim in this situation, just wants the book back so other people can read it. Arthur understands the harm he's caused the library and is willing to pay for a new copy of the book. Harsh for an eight-year-old, but an appropriate fix that he's willing to accept. But he doesn't have to, because Binky finds the book and returns it. The library's problem is resolved. They've got the book back. So Arthur no longer needs to pay anything to fix the situation. Binky takes care of Arthur by returning the book, but also by explaining how he found it. This is a vision of restorative justice, a community that can take care of itself, that can teach each other about what harm has been done, and can help each other arrive at a fix without a third party coming in and separating the supposed bad people. If you're like me, and you grew up in a community that respected you, that treated you as a person even when you were very young, that talked you through your feelings, and that taught you how to fix your mistakes when you broke something, this kind of solution would seem obvious. But not everyone was so lucky to grow up in a kind of community like this. I've seen so many videos of kids, especially black and brown kids, being beaten or handcuffed by cops in their own classrooms. This is the stuff of Arthur's most outlandish nightmares, and yet it's happening to these kids in real life. School discipline without the police is often just as bad. In some states, it's still legal to hit students with a wooden paddle. Even Illinois, which doesn't have corporal punishment, up until last year, allowed students elementary school students to be locked up in so-called isolation rooms, basically padded cells in the school, 
when they misbehaved. ProPublica investigative reporters are doing the Lord's work. And remember that rumor about Mr. Ratburn being this sadist who sends kids to death row if they don't do their homework? Well, minus the death part, this is another fantasy that has come true. If you're a kid on probation, you can be sent away to juvenile jail for things like not doing your homework or not making your bed. Even outside of the juvenile justice system, there are a lot of parents who've fallen under the sway of a certain fundamentalist Christian belief that takes the biblical phrase, spare the rod and spoil the child, literally. There's this pervasive belief that kids are born evil, that they can't feel guilt or take responsibility unless it's literally beaten into them. I'll link to essays in the description about all of these things. See the many content warnings from the beginning of this section. But I have to acknowledge that while I don't think kids are born evil, I think they can cause real harm. They can act impulsively just like the rest of us, and because their brains are still developing, they literally lack some of the hardware for impulse control. They're still learning empathy, so they can lash out in anger or say something cruel and not fully understand what it is they've done. I know it must be scary for parents, teachers, guardians, everyone when kids act out. You have to tell them what they've done wrong and why, teach them how to fix the situation, check in with their emotions, get the situation under control. That's a lot to handle. Restorative justice is a struggle. It's difficult. And what happens when a kid does something worse? What happens when a kid breaks the law? This is getting into some tough emotional territory, so let's take a breather and order some food. Okay, now that I've recreated the sugar bowl in my kitchen, it's time to make a sugar bowl recipe. We've got sandwiches, but uh, I don't know if I'm quite ready yet for the Harry Mills meatball experience. Okay, how about desserts? There's Sue Ellen's favorite, the big pig, that looks complicated. How about a simple strawberry thick shake that you shouldn't drink with friends who make you laugh? And you don't squirt a whole strawberry thick shake out your nose just to be polite. Okay, to make a strawberry thick shake, I'm following Adam Ragusea's milkshake making technique. So I've got milk, ice cream, strawberry preserves, and he recommends simple syrup, but I'm gonna use honey. We're supposed to put it all in a blender, but I don't have a blender, so I'm just gonna use my food processor. You know what? No, I am an adult human being with a little bit of an income. I'm gonna go right to Target and get a blender. Target didn't have a blender. We're gonna do it in the food processor. Two big scoops of ice cream, quarter cup of milk, about a tablespoon of honey, some of our strawberry preserves. The food processor is loud, so I'm gonna spare you. And there we have it, our own cute little strawberry thick shake. He's great, but please don't say anything funny. I don't want to shoot this out my nose. Okay, that thick shake hit the spot. Now it's time to discuss an episode that I've struggled with ever since I first saw it when I was a kid. Nerves of Steel. It's the one where Buster sees this hot new toy that all of his friends have, and he just can't wait for one, so he goes and steals one. For years after watching this episode, I had a hard time believing that Buster would do this. He's a good kid a good citizen, a cat saver. He would never steal. But then my inner monologue came to me and said, hey, um, you know, a lot of your friends, people you respect and trust have shoplifted. Don't think that just because you're chicken shit about breaking the law doesn't mean everyone else is. I mean, who are you, you goody two shoes, weenie little wiener dog of a man, you- Okay, we're gonna save you for my upcoming depression and anxiety video. Anyway, uh, abolish private property and all that. Plus, Buster is just a little bit klepto. That's part of his personality. He likes to ferret things away and put them in his little terrarium, especially rotting food that he liked when it was fresh. And there's that dinosaur episode where Buster finds this super rare fossilized footprint on a field trip and takes it home instead of donating it to the museum like he's supposed to. But then he's haunted by his guilty conscience and dreams about getting caught by the fossil police. Again, another dream about this primal fear of the carceral system. Also, I love how different characters have different kinds of imaginations. Like, Arthur has anxiety dreams about being imprisoned and chained to his books, but in Buster's dream, 
he doesn't even get arrested. The dinosaur from the fossil he found just comes to life and terrorizes everyone. Buster's a more fantastical thinker, so it's perfect. But then Buster wakes up with the most blood-curdling scream I think I've ever heard. Again, kudos to Daniel Broku for being an amazing voice actor. And then he goes right to the museum to return the fossil. And again, we see a restorative justice solution. Buster absolves his guilt by doing the right thing and returning the fossil, and the museum is just delighted to have such a rare find on display for everyone to see. Okay, so Buster has some klepto tendencies or whatever. I, I accept that. But Nerves of Steel, this episode I wanted to discuss, is a whole lot darker. So the premise of this episode is that Brain, Francine, and Binky all have hopped on this new trend called Cyber Toys. And Cyber Toys are literally just action figures, except every couple of minutes they start moving totally out of your control. Can someone tell me why these are trendy? No one? Arthur is on my side of this. He thinks cyber toys are creepy, but Buster is just stuck on the idea of getting one. I guess it's sort of a character trait of his to get hyper fixated on stuff, to build this fantastical image in his head of aliens or skater dudes or cyber toys that he just can't shake unless he can collect something. People who collect stuff, can you tell me whether you relate to Buster in this situation? I have hyper fixations too, but they tend to be less related to material, physical things. But anyway, now that the stage is set for turmoil, we see Buster and Arthur stopping by the drugstore on the way home from school. And of course, there's a display full of cyber toys just sitting there, tempting him. And finally, he gives in. He takes a toy off the shelf and stuffs it in Arthur's backpack while Arthur isn't looking. But Buster makes a really bad criminal. He didn't plan this at all. He's not going home with Arthur. He just put the toy in Arthur's backpack because the backpack happened to be open on the ground. And when he sees the security camera and the very friendly drugstore owner, he immediately feels this wave of guilt and shame. Now, Buster has wronged two people here. He's stolen from the drugstore owner and he's made Arthur an accessory to the crime. I actually think the second part of that is worse. He betrayed his friend's trust. But Buster is more freaked out about the stealing, which I can understand. The next scene is really interesting to me. Buster is processing what just happened in his head. He knows he's crossed a line here. He did something against the law. And he wonders if that's changed him. He imagines himself on trial with his friends as the jury. Now, how did you all spend your weekend? I studied motion detecting security systems. I read crime and punishment. I went on a field trip to the police station. I stole a cyber toy. <gasps> well, Buster Baxter, that definitely makes you a real crook. And that stigma he feels of crossing the line and becoming a real crook, that haunts him. It makes him wonder if he can ever go back to being a good person again. Still second base! Yeah! Go for broke! Steal third! No! Put it back! It's not worth it! He can't deal with this alone anymore, so he goes right to Arthur, who of course is shocked and horrified, but to his credit, sticks by his friend. They hatch a plan to return the toy and attach an anonymous apology note, which theoretically will absolve them of guilt without getting them caught. But the plan, of course, is doomed from the start. They get to the drugstore just as it opens, so they're the only customers there, and of course, the cyber toys have already sold out. There's no place to hide theirs on the shelf. So they just leave it in one of the aisles. But just as Buster is buying some candy to maintain their cover, the toy comes to life and walks right up to the counter because it's a cyber toy and you can't control them. Who would want one? Anyway, they're caught red-handed and the drugstore owner goes from friendly to no longer friendly. That was pretty scary to me as a child, a stranger getting mad at you. Buster confesses immediately to stealing the toy because he feels guilty and he can't let his friend go down with him and because he thinks he's been caught anyway. It was me! Check your 
security camera. You'll see it was me. That security camera? It isn't even working. It's not? But my telephone is. And I think I'd better make some phone calls. Boys, I know you meant well by returning the toy, but stealing it in the first place, well, that's where you went wrong. Very wrong. The drugstore owner takes matters into his own hands and calls their parents, and Arthur and Buster both get in trouble for different reasons. Even if you didn't take the toy, can't you see how covering it up made it worse? We're disappointed in you, Arthur. You and Buster. I'm disappointed in us, too. You're going to have a long time to think about what you did to this store and to yourself. I will. Arthur gets a stern talking to, and we end the episode finding out that Buster has been grounded for an entire month. You can wash up for dinner soon, Buster. And remember, dinner, but no dessert. She really knows how to hurt a guy. Like I said, this episode bothers me. It bothers me that Buster would do something so dangerous, and it bothers me to see a character get a punishment that's a lot harsher than usual by Arthur's standards. I mean, Buster's just an eight-year-old little klepto. He didn't mean it. It's all a bit heavy. But I have to admit, this is another example of a restorative justice solution. The drugstore owner could have absolutely gotten the police involved, as many people do with young kids who get in trouble, but he wisely chose not to. He knew that Arthur and Buster's families were strong enough to handle this on their own. One kind of restorative justice that Howard Zare writes about in Changing Lenses involves a juvenile offender's family being brought in to help explain to them the gravity of what they've done. In the new juvenile system adopted in New Zealand in 1989, all juvenile cases, except a few very violent crimes, are diverted from police or court into family group conferences, FGCs. The involvement of families in FGCs maximizes possibilities for what Australian criminologist John Braithwaite calls reintegrative shame. Reintegrative shame denounces the offense, but not the offender, and, in addition, offers a way back. FGCs provide a forum for this positive application of shame. The potential for denouncing the wrong is tremendous within the circle of the family. It is bad enough to be shamed in front of the victim, but imagine facing your grandmother or grandfather. Since the offender is part of the family, however, FGCs also provide encouragement for affirming the worth of the offender. Family members reportedly often articulate their dismay and anger at the behavior, yet affirm the essential value and gifts of the young person who is offended. I'm honestly a little iffy on this technique, especially as someone with internalized shame. But Buster's mom certainly does shame him. She does it in an interesting way, though. You're going to have a long time to think about what you did to this store and to yourself. What you did to this store and to yourself. Like Buster, his mother seems to believe that he's debased himself somehow, that he has indeed crossed some sort of line into crook territory. But her shaming is meant to get him to work his way back out. I might not agree with grounding as a form of punishment, but at least Buster's punishment gives him some quiet time to himself, allows him the opportunity to think and reflect. If he'd been handcuffed or interrogated or given a court date, I think he'd just be too terrified to do any reflecting. I know that Arthur's town, Elwood City, is portrayed as a bit of a utopia, where kids can ride their bikes everywhere safely, and where people from every culture get along. But I hope Arthur gives kids a vision of what a loving, restorative community can look like, especially kids whose behavior has been criminalized, kids who've been handcuffed or locked up in isolation rooms. I hope it leaves them with an idea that maybe we don't need outside institutions to dispense justice. Maybe people are more complex than I thought. Maybe people, even people who've done harm, 
really do have it in them to repair the world. Anyway, that's just a place to start. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what I do, consider becoming a monthly donor on Patreon. You can also find a link in the description of this video to mybookshop.org, where you can buy Changing Lenses and all the books that I mention in my video essays. See you all again soon.